Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Neha Mishra. Uh oh, hold on one second for some reason. Okay. I'm so sorry to the interpreters, I'm hearing it. Should I be hearing it? Okay, hopefully it's okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Neha Mishra. And I am with an organization called the Solidarity Center. I'm the global lead for migration and human trafficking. Solidarity Center is an international labor rights NGO uh, headquartered in Washington with 30 field offices around the world and working in more than 60 countries on every aspect of worker rights. We are thrilled today to be moderating this panel uh, for the Feminist Fridays conversations about labor migration from a feminist lens which is a collaborative initiate, uh, initiative, excuse me, <clears throat> of the Association for Women's Rights and Development, AWID, focus on labor exploitation, FLEX, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, GATW, and the Women in Migration Network, along with Solidarity Center. Before we go further, I want to remind everyone uh, that we have interpretation. In order to use the inter interpretation, at the bottom of the uh, uh, Zoom panel, you should see a button for interpretation. And you can click on the language that you would like to hear. We have English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Indonesian. In order to hear only uh, the language that you chose, after you choose the language, click on the button that says mute original audio. I'm going to pause for a minute to allow the interpreters uh, to explain this also. Um, Neha, I'll explain in Spanish if that's okay. If you have any questions or issues with interpretation, please just uh, uh, put it in the chat. Also today, we are uh, going to be um, taking questions through the Q&A function that you should see at the bottom of uh, your screen. You can just click on Q&A and you can put your questions in there. Um, also, you can do it in any of the four languages that I mentioned, English, Spanish, Portuguese, or Indonesian. So again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I am so excited to be moderating this session. Uh, the song, I, I, I wonder if you could see me singing in the background with the song that we started Rise Up this morning. It, it's a beautiful song and hard not to sing along to. Uh, it gave me a lot of motivation. Um, but what is, what is making me even more excited about our session today is the amazing panelists that we have. I, I think you will all find them as inspirational as I do, and I will introduce them in just a minute. As I mentioned, the, the session today are, is our fifth Feminist Friday session, <clears throat> where we're looking at labor migration from a feminist lens, from an intersectional feminist lens. In our first section, uh, session, we talked about what is intersectionality, and I know uh, sometimes that intersectionality is a term um, that is not necessarily used everywhere. And so it's one of the reasons that we, we talked about it in the first session. But regardless of what we call it, I think what, we're, what we mean by the idea of intersectional feminism is a feminism that takes into account all the different identities that we all come to with, whether it's our race, our gender, our sexual orientation, um, our nationality, our migration status, uh, all the different things that make us individuals, but that we need to take into account as we're talking about uh, change in the world. In today's session, we're specifically gonna be talking about organizing. And I've been in the labor movement for a really long time now. And uh, I've seen that oftentimes as organizations, including unions, are doing organizing, there can still be a very traditional lens on that. 
There's still patriarchy that comes into that at times. There's still racism, sexism. Um, all of those things can come into hierarchies and organizations and in the way organizations are structured and the way organizations are led. We wanted to discuss today how to break down those structures, how to address the patriarchy, how to take on the elements of capitalism and the global economy that create this type of organizing that limit and marginalize those of us of different identities. And as I said, I'm so excited that we have three amazing uh, organizers with us today that are gonna talk about how they do that. And then we have two of my colleagues from the Solidarity Center who are gonna be respondents and help us reflect on what it is, the elements that our panelists have talked about that have made change in the terms of the way that they organize. So with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, our first panelist today, I'm so excited again, please forgive me if you guys see me that I, I just, uh, my enthusiasm is, is gonna, boil over a little bit today because I'm so excited about all the panelists we have. Um, our first panelist today is Hilda Blanco. Hilda comes to us uh, from the international, uh, from the national, excuse me, Domestic Workers Alliance and the International Domestic Workers um, Federation. She's a Seattle-based organizer working to develop the leadership of Black, Black domestic workers through innovative worker circle, women's circle models. She was born in the northern coast of Guatemala uh, in the cradle of African descent, Garfuna culture. And she has studied communication science. She immigrated to the United States in the early 2000s where she worked as a house cleaner for more than 14 years. And then she joined the worker centers Casa Latina where she founded the leadership group Women Without Borders, and worked on popular education, green cleaning, health and safety standards in the workplace. She's been a leader of the National Domestic Workers Alliance since 2012. And as a Dorothy Bolden Fellow, she focused on organizing Black domestic workers in Seattle and helped shepherd the Seattle Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which was signed um, by the mayor into law in 2018. And she represents North America on the executive committee of the International Domestic Workers Federation. She's been serving in this role since 2018 in recognition of her leadership at the local and national levels and because of her vision for a powerful global domestic worker movement. So Hilda, welcome today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to just start by asking you that the National Domestic Workers Alliance, NDWA, is one of my favorite organizations because it lives the vision of intersectionality and inclusive, inclusivity in its mission, vision, and all of its work. Could you discuss how NDWA develops structures to encourage inclusivity and how do you use intersectionality and, and inclusivity in your organizing work? Thank you, Hilda. Eh, ¿Me escuchan? ¿Me escuchan? Are you hear me? Ok, yo, uh, buenos días, eh, buenas tardes. Um, estoy casi que medio despierta en esos momentos, pero gracias, muchas gracias, uh, Nija, por, por, eh, por invitarme, por invitar a nuestra organización a este espacio, uh, lo cual es, una, es un espacio En, en la que ya, ya necesitábamos hace muchísimos años, ¿verdad? Um, nuestro, uh, quiero hablar de un poco acerca del trabajo de, de la Alianza Nacional de Trabajadoras del Hogar aquí en los Estados Unidos, que se fundó en el 2007, ¿verdad? Um, eh, conglomerando eh, un grupo de trabajadoras del hogar en la cual ya era... Eh, eh, necesario enfocarse en esa industria, ya que es una industria que no es visible, ¿verdad? Eh, aún teniendo un movimiento de trabajadoras del hogar aquí en los Estados Unidos, seguimos trabajando para poder tener una visibilidad muy importante, no nada más en Estados Unidos, sino que a nivel global, ¿verdad? Y este, el, el trabajo de, de NDWA 
eh, se realizó con, con un grupo de enfoque primeramente, con un comité coordinador para poder eh, desarrollar una estructura de base fuerte, ya que eh, es, es el primer, eh, primer movimiento de trabajadoras de, de, del hogar nacido aquí en los Estados Unidos, que es una, es una organización muy, muy joven, tiene aproximadamente entre 10 y 11 años. Eh, eh, entonces, pero ya que dentro de la participación de, la, de las actividades creadas por la organización, eh, estuvo eh, la participación también a través del, del liderazgo organizativo, creando análisis de cambio, de, de cultura, que eso fue lo que, um, eh, en lo que nos basamos en poder crear eh, eh, ciertos cambios estructurales por, por ese mismo cambio de cultura. A partir de allí eh, eh, empezamos a desarrollar la misión y, y la visión de NDWA eh, en base a estudios, ¿verdad? Estudios y encuestas que, que nos fue arrojando la estadística de 2.5 millones de trabajadoras del hogar eh, en los Estados Unidos. Sabemos que, que se estiman que puede ir incrementando también. Eh, entonces, eh, Estados Unidos eh, tiene una mayoría de, de, dentro de esa industria de mujeres inmigrantes, ¿verdad? En la cual ha, ha, ha sido eh, mujeres que trabajan en limpieza de casa, mujeres que trabajan haciendo eh, ni, a trabajo de niñera, eh, trabajo de cuidadoras y otros tipos de trabajo, etc. Pero dentro de ese estudio eh, nos, nos fuimos dando cuenta en ese proceso eh, de que... Um, había mujeres como yo, por ejemplo, ¿verdad? Mujeres que, que vi, estaban viniendo de distintos países, eh, de todas partes del mundo, de Latinoamérica, de Sudamérica, um, este, eh, sin, sin documentos en este país, para empezar. Um, y no había uh, un, eh, una forma de tener ese respaldo allá afuera para nosotras. Y prácticamente el trabajo de NDWA vino a visibilizar nuestro trabajo y, y a darnos una posición en la cual el, el, el país no nos da por, por, por ser indocumentadas. ¿no? Eh, trabajé en esa industria por, por más de 14 años, como lo mencionaba en mi hija en mi, en mi, en, en mi biografía, eh, eh, sin conocer mis derechos laborales. Eh, Sufrí muchos robos de salario, sufrí muchos abusos en ese lugar de trabajo eh, sin conocer ninguna organización quien me respaldara en aquel entonces. Entonces, eh, la Alianza Nacional de Trabajadoras del Hogar vinimos a crear y, y a enfocarnos eh, en el desarrollo del liderazgo de las trabajadoras del hogar inmigrantes para poder, para poder luchar por, por nuestros propios derechos en el país. ¿verdad? que vino a incrementar el desarrollo del liderazgo de esas mujeres a través de un programa de liderazgo que se llamaba SOL, eh, Estrategia Organizativa de, 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 de Liderazgo, ¿no? pero para también fomentar una base fuerte en, 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 en encontrar posibles eh, eh, ataques allá afuera, como lo hemos estado viendo a nivel global, a nivel, a nivel de trabajo que, que hemos estado teniendo aquí en los Estados Unidos, hay muchísimos ataques en contra de nuestras comunidades, en contra de nuestras comunidades sin razón que venimos a buscar oportunidades de trabajo a este país. Y también este, uh, sabemos de que eh, la, la industria de trabajadoras del hogar en Estados Unidos hay un aproximado de 90% de, de nuestra membresía son documentadas, ¿verdad? Es un, es un aproximado estadístico eh, que, hace, eh, que hace posible cualquier otro tipo de trabajo en los Estados Unidos porque venimos a, a contribuir a la economía del país, pero a la misma vez eh, no somos reconocidos como tal. Entonces, eh, la Alianza Nacional ha, ha eh, eh, trabajado para poder este, eh, dignificar, ¿verdad? reconocer el trabajo de las trabajadoras del hogar. Y como lo mencionaba antes, son 2.5 millones y, y, y ese número puede ir incrementando como, o, como trabajadores esenciales en este país, uh, valga la, 
la situación de la pandemia ha, ha, se ha surgido también demasiado eh, abusos laborales, ¿verdad? En ese, en ese, en ese sentido, en, nuestro, en nuestra industria de, de, de trabajadoras del hogar y también este, um, eh, eh, hemos, hemos perdido muchas, muchas compañeras eh, este, que, que se han infectado con, con la pandemia, el COVID. Um, ha, ha sido una situación muy difícil. Pero la organización eh, de las trabajadoras del hogar también eh, ha, ha estado haciendo mucho, eh, eh, mucho eh, eh, análisis eh, eh, en, en diferentes sectores de la industria de limpieza y, y en la mayoría eh, con los empleadores también para poder respetar lo, los derechos de, de, de las trabajadoras del hogar aquí en, aquí en los Estados Unidos y, y también a través de, de muchísimos talleres, a, a través de muchísima educación, muchísima información eh, que, um, que ayuda a, 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 que, a que podamos eh, eh, basarnos en, 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 en bases muy importantes que, que esté ayudando a eh, eh, avanzar, ¿verdad? El, el, la, la mecánica de, del reconocimiento de los derechos de las trabajadoras de, del hogar en los Estados Unidos. Básicamente eh, eh, ha, sido, ha sido un trabajo de, de muchísimo, muchísimo tiempo, muchísimo esfuerzo, eh, muchísimas luchas. Eh, este, uno, uno de los enfoques principales también es cómo ganar las políticas públicas, ¿verdad? Eh, nos enfocamos mucho en, en la parte de, la, de las políticas públicas eh, porque es de ahí donde podemos eh, eh, ganar eh, políticas más permanentes que ayude a estabilizar eh, eh, la vida el, el, los derechos y las oportunidades que, que hay dentro de esa industria aquí en los Estados Unidos. Thank you so much, Hilda. Thank you so much. And I have a number of questions, but we'll get back to that in just a minute, uh, in just a few minutes. Um, our next speaker is Carmen Helena Fiera Foro, the Secretary General of CUT Brazil. Carmen is a family farmer who started her activism at a young age in rural areas of Brazil. She formed her activism in the Rural Workers Union, where she helped to uh, empower the voice of women in the countryside and the forest as she started to build her own leadership capacities. In 1990, she won the right to form her own, to have her own union membership. And then in the following year, she led the union. She assumed the presidency of the union in the early 90s. And then during the same period, she assumed the coordination for the entire region. Later on, she was elected as the executive director of the Federation of Agricultural Workers Union of the state of Pará taking over the newly created Secretariat of the Rural Working Women and of uh, for social and social policies in the next term. She joined the CUT National Board in 2003. She was part of the executive board of the National Confederation of Agricultural Workers, uh, Agricultural Workers, excuse me, with the mission of coordinating the National Secretariat of Rural Working Women. In, 19, in 2006, she assumed the vice presidency of the CUT. And once again, uh, as always, she became the first woman, in addition to the first rural woman, woman from the Amazon, uh, to preside over the CUT in Brazil. She was the first director of the newly created Secretariat for the Environment at CUT, devising a human development model that can be sustainable and supportive. Consecutively re-elected Vice President of CUT from 2012 to 2019, she was elected Secretary General in 2019. Thank you so much, Carmen, for joining us today. Again, I'm, I'm very excited <laughs> to hear from you. Uh, Carmen, my question for you is, the CUT has taken a deliberate approach to organizing that focuses on race, gender, and other intersectional issues. Can you tell us how you came about developing this approach? Why and how you have implemented? Thank you. Bom dia, 
a Nerra, a todas as participantes desse importante debate, Sextas-feiras Feministas. Ser feminista é, de fato, uma missão cotidiana. Na, não está separada da nossa vida. É, eu estou agradecida pelo convite, é, feliz por poder participar e compartilhar uh, um pouco de minha experiência, da experiência que eu tenho na Central Única dos Trabalhadores e das Trabalhadoras, da experiência que tenho como uma mulher que vive na Amazônia brasileira e da experiência que tenho de lutas coletivas. São essas três questões que me impulsionam bastante. É, primeiro, eu gostaria de dizer que minha militância vem daqui do interior da Amazônia e eu queria contextualizar duas grandes questões que eu considero muito importantes para falar do compromisso que nós temos com as lutas raciais, antirraciais, né, nossa luta, é, para falar da luta feminista que nós fazemos cotidianamente e entendendo que no Brasil, eu acho que em qualquer lugar do mundo, como o Neira falou, né, a gente tem que enfrentar o patriarcado e que ah, o racismo, ah, 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 o patriarcado, eles são muito estruturantes é, em todos os lugares da sociedade, inclusive dentro da nossa própria organização. É, eu queria dizer que eu venho da CONTAG, uma experiência muito forte. Eu diria que a experiência mais forte da minha vida foi organizar uma marcha por desenvolvimento com as mulheres em 2011, exatamente no ano que nós elegemos uma mulher presidenta da República, que foi a presidenta Dilma. Neste ano, nós impulsionamos uma grande mobilização com 100 mil mulheres, com uma pauta de desenvolvimento para o país e uma pauta voltada à superação das desigualdades existentes entre homens e mulheres. Eu, nós aqui no Brasil, isso é muito pouco falado, mas nós somos o último país fora da África a abolir a escravidão. E a chaga do, da escravidão, ela convive conosco até hoje. São 130 anos apenas de uma formalidade da, do fim da escravidão. Portanto, as leis, os costumes, as atitudes, elas refletem muito ainda a escravidão no nosso país. E uh, eu vivo num país que na América Latina é um dos mais racistas e machistas. Então, nossa experiência de mobilizar o desenvolvimento, nós mulheres agricultoras, adquirimos a consciência de que a comida que chega na mesa dos trabalhadores, das trabalhadoras da sociedade brasileira, ela é majoritariamente produzida pela agricultura familiar e majoritariamente na agricultura familiar produzida pelas mãos das mulheres. Então, uma luta por visibilidade, por reconhecimento, por garantia de políticas públicas que incluem desde o documento básico né, carteira de identidade, né, registro de nascimento, até condições de produção, condições de financiamento e de políticas públicas para garantir a nossa existência no meio rural brasileiro. Como é que a CUT interlaça sua ação com o tema do racismo, do, do machismo, né? permanentemente. É, primeiro, eu estou hoje numa cidade que aqui na Amazônia, é, no estado do Pará, no coração da Amazônia, que aqui no estado do Pará tem 400 comunidades quilombolas. Explicando o que, é que são comunidades quilombolas, são comunidades onde, no período da escravidão, os negros fugiam e criavam uma comunidade de resistência. Então, na Amazônia brasileira, nós somos em torno de mil comunidades né, reconhecidas. Não reconhecidas, são mais de 5.700. Então, 
Então, há um atraso muito grande do governo em reconhecer o território dessas populações. Avançamos bastante durante o governo Lula, é, mas ainda falta muito. E essa é a chama é, e a necessidade de resistência que faz com que a CUT se articule. Nós, mulheres negras no país, sofremos discriminação absurda, violência como herança do, macho, do, 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 da, da, do período escravagista. Não só o uso da nossa força de trabalho, mas a violência incorporada, cotidiana nas nossas vidas, ainda é uma realidade. Nós, mulheres negras. É importante ressaltar isso, porque eu estou falando de um país com 211 milhões enquanto população, estou falando da Amazônia brasileira, que tem 24 milhões de pessoas morando nela, e estou falando de uma sociedade brasileira que tem mais de 50% de sua população negra. E eu estou falando de um país que estruturalmente permanece fora da América Latina, com índices muito altos de ausência de mulheres nos espaços de poder. Então, eu queria, nesse primeiro momento, dizer que nossa voz só tem eco porque nós estamos organizadas coletivamente. Que a voz coletiva e que o feminismo é necessário para virarmos a página da escravidão, é necessário para virarmos a página do patriarcado. Eu sei que vai demorar muito tempo, mas nossas vozes feministas precisam ecoar no Brasil e fora do Brasil. Portanto, eu me sinto muito grata de compartilhar com vocês nossas experiências e de ouvir outras experiências. Thank you so much. Carmen, again, I'm feeling so excited and I have a number of questions which we'll get to uh, after we hear from any and, and our respondents. Um, thank you so much. Um, so uh, our, our next panelist, uh, sorry, just give me one sec, is Eni Lestari. Eni is an Indonesian domestic worker in Hong Kong and a migrant rights activist. She's the current chairperson of International Migrants Alliance the first ever global alliance of grassroots migrants, immigrants, refugees, and other displaced persons. After escaping her abusive employer, she transformed herself from a victim into an organizer for domestic workers in particular and migrant workers in general. In 2000, she founded the Association of Indonesian Migrant Workers, which later expanded to Macau, Taiwan, and Indonesia. For two decades, she's been active in the empowerment of migrants and advocacy of migrant rights. She's held a lot of different positions um, in various organizations, including the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, uh, being on the board of the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, uh, the Asian Migrants Coordinating Body, the Network of Indonesian Migrant Workers, um, and uh, an advisor for the Association of Return Migrants and Families in Indonesia. She's an active resource person in forums organized by academics, interfaith groups, civil societies, trade unions, and many others at national, regional, and international levels. She's received nominations and awards from a number of organizations, uh, and she's uh, been a speaker at the United Nations um, in New York. Thank you so much, Annie, for joining us today. My question for you to start with, um, all right, give me one second, is in, in your work with women migrant workers in the informal economy in Asia, how and why have you incorporated an intersectional feminist approach to organize? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neha, and good morning. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, this is really my honor to be part of the Friday discussion of on feminism and by feminists. So uh, regarding the question about the informal sector in Asia, uh, actually, in Asia, the biggest number of migrant workers are really in the informal sector. So whether you are men, whether you are women, most of us are in the infor informal. 
but the biggest employment of women uh, migrants here are really in the caregiver and domestic worker sector. So we are moving within the region, for example, Indonesia, Philippines, Bangladesh, they are moving to other neighboring countries like Hong Kong, myself, you know, Taiwan, Middle East, Malaysia, and so forth. And uh, the situation of uh, informal sector, when we say informal sector in Asia, uh, one, uh, uh, one fact is that we are not being protected by any legal system. We are not included in the labor ordinance of receiving countries. And that means that we don't have any proper employment contract. We don't have a standard contract. Even the ILO convention on C-189 already talk about you know, uh, right of decent work for domestic worker, but most countries in Asia do not ratify. So they are not uh, obliged actually to even uh, introduce or even enforce the standard rights for migrant uh, women domestic workers. So, uh, so we are excluded from the labor ordinance and other kind of regulation in that countries. But uh, even within our home countries, uh, we are not also being protected legally. So many of our countries are actually creating a law that is more uh, promotion to labor migration rather than protecting of uh, migrant, migrant workers. The second aspect is that um, most of the countries in Asia do not really recognize right to union. So most countries are not really, or, uh, they are not legally organized. They are organizing, but most of us are in the, un, what I call it underground organization, means they are just formally, informally gathering, they create group based on their, you know, uh, workplace or maybe where they come from, and they're helping each other. For example, during pandemic, uh, distribution of masks, sanitizer, food. Uh, for those who are losing the job, is becoming a kind of our activities now. So you don't really need to have a legal status just for you to do that. So a right to association, uh, you know, freedom of expression is not even our right in the uh, in the first place. And then the third aspect is that um, uh, we are forced to live in with the employers. That means we are really twenty four hours a day with employer and seven days a week with employer. So uh, that means that we are very vulnerable to long working hours. Uh, the accommodation is uh, very unregulated. Every you know, many of us are even sleeping on the floor in the uh, in the balcony or in the storage and so forth. So uh, the live-in mandatory has really caused a lot of uh, violence against women uh, because no privacy, no safety, and uh, physical sexual abuse is is becoming very very common. But now. Uh, one of our finding in during pandemic, there is actually an escalation or increase uh, in terms of physical, verbal, sexual abuse uh, against migrant domestic workers. In fact, some women that we are organizing are actually being raped or, or molested, you know. And again, because of this pandemic, a lot of families are denying them to even go out. They say it's a pandemic, so you shouldn't go out because when you come back, you will bring coronavirus with you or you, you will bring COVID-19. So this kind of stigmatization that, you know, uh, poor woman, darker skin, whenever you go means you will bring COVID-19 is something that is very strong in Asia and very strong to uh, discriminate the woman uh, migrant workers. So uh, this has been our battle. And the last thing that I want to say in terms of challenges or realities we are facing is really um, denial of uh, RESTI itself. So uh, one of the country in Asia who still um, provide legal right on RESTI is only Hong Kong, where I come from, uh, where I'm working today. So th because of that, we have somehow uh, some uh, possibilities to meet on Sunday, organize ourselves because without rest day, you cannot even um, you know connect with your friend, uh, express grievances, and even organize. So rest day become really the key for women migrants uh, to be uh, more aware about their rights and also get help when they need one. But beyond that, it's also a way for you to learn your rights and be organized. So without rest day, it's really almost impossible for any woman migrants to be even empowered and even protected. Yeah. So that's why it is understandable that many countries like Middle East, Malaysia, where uh, they really ban domestic workers from having day off, maybe 
it's not like ban, but they legally do not provide a day off, they are naturally, they are really, really triple vulnerable to different type of exploitation. But during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a lot of employers and even government are taken for granted uh, of the social distancing policies by telling all these women migrants, please stay at home uh, during your rest day. Uh, but this is not our home. This is our office. This is our workplace. So uh, we found out that many of even our union members are being locked down in prison in the employer house for months, even a year because of this pandemic. So the challenges among us is really getting more intense, uh, greater. Uh, so, and in terms of this, uh, you know, feminist approach, intersectional, really in this time of pandemic, we try to reflect a lot on, you know, in the past we used to organize women migrants based on their workers' right only, you know, labor right. But then when the issues is getting more intense, when the women migrants is, are already talking about their gender issues, their children, their rights as a woman to, to be practiced for example, uh, you know, uh, to have families or even, you know, uh, the right to have a privacy in the employer house, we realize that it's not enough only to talk about women migrants from the lens of labor right, you know. So we, we began engaging on the issue of rights of women in terms of health, right to communication, right to religion, and even right to, to you know, sexual orientation, for example. So we are, are now injecting, in the past three years, we have been introducing uh, education on women's rights, even the rights to divorce, and even the mechanism to, you know, to proceed with their divorce if they want to. So our uh, movement has been trying to be more proactive in terms of embracing different aspects of women uh, aspect in the labor migration of women migrants. So this is quite uh, complex, I can say. It's very challenging. In fact, myself, in my experience, uh, helping women, uh, you know, leaving their abusive relationship with a husband, even they've been separated for 10 years, 15 years, it's not that easy because they are really feeling that they are obliged to follow such, you know, uh, social demand for them to be a good housewife, a good mother, even when they are abused, exploited, and so forth. So it took us a while just to make women realize that they have a choice to free themselves, you know, because they, they already learn one step ahead of being empowered through labor migration. To some extent, they learn to earn their own money. They learn to, to you know, to step, uh, to, to stand on with their own uh, dignity. Now, another step is to really re liberate themselves from this kind of, you know, family, or societal uh, pressure, but it really take a while, uh, and uh, the the empowerment in terms of labor right and empowerment of, as a, as them as a woman is really I can say goes hand in hand and cannot be like one after the other. You know, it's really a process. I can say it's really self discovery and evolution, but somehow it really give us a lot of lesson in terms of. Uh, become more uh, holistic and comprehensive in uh, empowering the women migrants. So I think that's what I would like to say. Neha. Thank you so much, Annie. And again, thank you so much to, to Hilda, Carmen, and Annie for starting uh, uh, our conversation out. So much there um, that I want to ask. Um, but I think one of our goals today was to make this sort of a dialogue. And so I've asked uh, two of my Solidarity Center colleagues um, who are kick-ass organizers themselves to join us to reflect a little bit on what the panelists said and, and uh, uh, reflections related to what does this mean for organizing for all of us as, as women uh, uh, workers, as women migrant workers, um, et cetera. And so I'm going to ask my two colleagues to give some of the reflections and then turn back to our panelists um, to respond and to add to that. Um, and then we will uh, have that conversation for the next about 20 minutes, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll continue the conversation and get to questions and answers. So I'm so excited, first of all, to introduce you to my colleague, Robin Rungi. Robin is uh, the co-director of the Solidarity Center's Equality and Inclusion Department. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce you, Emily, too, to make it easier. Emily is in our Trade Union Strengthening Department. Um, as I said, they are both kick-ass organizers and have been doing a lot of um, 
thinking around the issue of intersectional feminism and organizing, but also actually uh, implementing and doing that work in, in the field. So Robin, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start to reflect a little bit on what you've heard already today. Sure, thank you so much, Neha, and thank you all for the opportunity to join this phenomenal conversation. Just wanna honor uh, the voices of our sisters. I just um, learned so much from all three of you um, and I want to recognize the, the work and the commitment and the leadership. Um, and you represent, right, what we're here talking about, your personal experiences and um, the knowledge and experiences that you shared really reflects the power of an intersectional leadership. So all of you bring your, and I love the way you spoke about your different experiences, right? Starting with you, Hilda, talking about your identity, right? And the identity of domestic workers in the United States and how there are so many different identities, but one thing that is shared is that they are migrant workers, right? And so that is a common ground and that they experience multiple intersecting forms of discrimination and oppression and abuse based on those statuses as migrant workers from a variety of different countries with different races and ethnicities. And they're all women, right? So they share that identity. But that, that means that as a group, collectively, it's necessary to ensure that fighting for rights and power reflects their needs, which are different, right? Than me, for example, as a white woman, right? From the United States who has citizenship in the country I live in. And that in, in, in fact, having women with those identities lead is also critical because it results in different advocacy, right? It results in different responses that are tailored to the needs of workers and thus are inclusive. So I just wanted to, to honor that. And then Carmen, you know, really, um, you raised so many key things. I think one of the things that I took away from your comments was you can't separate your identity as a feminist, right? From your identity as a woman, as a worker, as an agricultural worker, as a union leader. And you talked about the power of the collective voice of feminism and unions. And I think, again, we need to, when I think about intersectionality, I'm also thinking about rural, urban, right? And you talked about these thousands of different communities that have formed over the years um, in, in Brazil, right? These resistant communities and how that's a part of this movement as well. Um, and I just wanted to echo what you said, which is it's not like I, I identify as a feminist. I identify as a woman with a disability, right? And I don't like walk around and some days I'm like, I'm a woman with a disability and I don't think about the fact that I'm a feminist, right? And I don't walk around some days and identify, right, as a feminist and I never ever lose my identity as a person with a disability. And how does that inform your advocacy? And Carmen, I thought you did such a wonderful job of articulating um, the experiences that you had with these multiple identities um, and that feminism is not separate, right? It's not separate. It's not this thing you talk about over here. It's an integral part of, of who you are. And I just wanted to honor um, that recognition. And then the other thing that each of you touched on, um, and I wanted to talk, Ina, about what you said, which is that, you know, patriarchy is everywhere. Racism is everywhere, right? So we have these different forms of oppression um, that are present in all of the different communities in which you're working in different countries, but how they manifest and then the impact they have on the workers. And I was thinking, you know, about how you were describing most recently, um, the experiences of uh, domestic workers and migrant workers in Asia during COVID, right? And we know that the abuses being experienced are driven by, and, and again, this goes back to something, Hilda, that you said, you know, migrant workers in these workplaces, which aren't even recognized as work in many countries, right? So we have discrimination and abuses based on uh, migratory status, based on the kind of work being performed, based on the fact that they're women, um, and there's even more than that. These individuals then also have identities as people um, who affiliate with particular religions um, and affiliate with and recognize themselves as people uh, with disabilities. And I wanna be clear, what we hear from you, and I wanna finish my comments with this, is that it's not that different people with different intersecting identities experience more 
uh, oppression and discrimination. It's different. And that's, does that make sense? Like it's, we really need to pull that out. It's, it's not, it's, it's different. I don't know how to explain what I'm saying, <laughs> but I hope our sisters will help me engage in that conversation. Um, and, and how that, that your leadership is necessary to ensure that the needs and the rights of workers with multiple different identities is recognized. Um, and that's what you all represent is so powerful. Um, and, and I think particularly I'm thinking about the different sectors that um, and economies that you represent um, and how intersectionality also means informal work and formal work, which all of you touched on, right? So thank you for the opportunity to reflect on these phenomenal uh, discussion and um, it's just a privilege to be in this space with all of you. Thank you so much, Robin. Emily, I'm gonna go straight to you. Great, thanks Neha. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I echo everything that Robin just said. I'm not gonna repeat it because I think she articulated it really well, um, but I wanna just pull out a couple themes that I took from an organizing perspective um, uh, from what each of the panelists said. And actually I wrote this down under Hilda's um, discussion and then I, I noticed it come out amongst everyone, um, all of the panelists, that organizing migrant workers, particularly those involved in less visible work, is, it's not only an intersectional feminist act, it's an act that breaks, it, and, and perhaps being an intersectional feminist act is, an act that breaks down the remnants of colonialization, imperialism, and white supremacy. And so even though it might be a small underground group of people for a period of time gathering on your few days off in a month to talk about issues, that very act of becoming, working to become visible, demanding rights, demanding to be included in legislation, standing tall amongst other workers who have historically been able to assert their role in the economic development of the country, it shifts power. And I think that's how all of our comrades across the panel spoke about their work was really shifting power and rethinking power. That power is not um, a patriarchal um, concept, that there is a way to have intersectional feminist power that is inclusive, it is expansive, and it brings in more and more people to be active participants in their society. Um, I, I want to think about, you know, I, I also want to say, um, as an organizer, I, I work with um, unions, across the globe, particularly in West and Southern Africa, um, some of whom are marginalized workers, domestic workers and, and agriculture workers, but some of whom are not. And I wanna honor the NDWA, the National um, Domestic Workers Alliance and the um, IDWF because your curriculum, the way that you think about organizing and reframe it has been something I have looked to as a tool myself in order to talk about organizing and, the, and structure building as a way of breaking down some of those old school organizing approaches that are steeped in patriarchy. Um, and one of the key important things is acknowledging the human beings that are involved in organizing and that we need to be centered and brought back to why we're doing this work. Um, I just wanted to speak to a couple more things. Um, I think, you know, I, I spoke to what Hilda and Carmen it, it kind of came together. I really was pulling a lot of your comments. Um, it's felt really connected that not only is, it, is that work that's going on with the coot that you're so valiantly leading Carmen um, of breaking down those remnants of colonialism and imperialism and white supremacy um, and asserting your roles. Uh, I'm just, I'm so honored to hear your story. And I, I hope that one day we can 
do some pairing and some some bringing together of, of workers who are organizing in similar ways and find those interlinking um, that work. Um, and I think one thing I, I did want to pull out uh, was also that organizing creates the opportunity for women to be full citizens of a society. And when I say citizen, I don't mean in the nation state sort of approach. What I mean is a fully engaged participant and that that a view of intersectional feminist organizing and engagement means each participant, each member of who is involved in those acts, not only is learning about their rights as a woman or a worker, and they can bring that to their job, but they can bring it to their citizenship as they participate in their own, in the society where they happen to live in the moment and their society that they go to at any other time. If we're thinking about migration and um, the movement of people, where people get to actively participate in their society. So thank you. And um, it's been an honor to, to listen and participate. Thank you so much, Emily. So we have about uh, seven minutes before the break. And so I would like to turn it back to our panelists to reflect on uh, both what Emily and Robin said, but also what the fellow panelists said. And then after the break, we had a couple questions um, come up from the audience, but I also have some specific questions. But first, Hilda, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Um, to maybe re just reflect a little bit on uh, what Emily and Robin said and then what 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 you heard Carmen and Annie talk about too. Uh, Hilda? Bueno, este, para mí ha sido um, algo enriquecedor ese espacio y poder uh, como panelistas, ¿verdad? mandar el mensaje que se requiere en esa conversación. Uh, la, el comentario de, de Robin y Emily um, ha creado como amalgamó básicamente eh, eh, esta, esas estructuras y ese trabajo que hemos estado realizando aquí eh, en los Estados Unidos y, y vamos, eh, el, el empoderamiento eh, del de liderazgo de, de nuestro movimiento y creer también De, que, de, de creer en nuestro trabajo ha sido fundamental, fundamental en todo ese proceso, ¿verdad? No, no es, uh, el, el trabajo de NDWA ha sido un, un trabajo muy ambicioso de, de, de poder serlo para poder llegar a, 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 eso, a ese nivel organizativo aquí en los Estados Unidos. Eh, eh, hace aproximadamente un mes um, nos sentamos con la vicepresidenta, vicepresidenta Kamala Harris aquí por primera vez después del año 1930. Las trabajadoras del hogar pudieron sentarse con una vicepresidenta en los Estados Unidos llevando ese mensaje de inclusión en medio de esa intersección. Y, y créanme, Cuando yo estuve sentada con Kamala Harris, me sentí la mujer más feminista del mundo, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, es, es representar estas voces y, 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 es, y es necesario continuar haciendo esa conversación porque estamos llegando a nuestro objetivo, estamos más, llegando más allá, pero después de 400 años de resistencia, eh, eh, nos hace falta mucho trabajo por hacer. Thank you, Hilda. And so, Carmen? So, I'm very grateful with the comment of Emily and Robin. I have two questions. It's important that our feminist voices are very connected, because if you look at it, the problem of 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 the problem das imigrações, elas têm um, um desenho muito parecido. No Brasil, as principais imigrações da Venezuela, né, por todos os problemas políticos que a gente acompanhou agora, é, são os bolivianos e as mulheres destes países trabalham de forma praticamente escrava na área de confecção de roupas, e estão também dispersas aí 
no trabalho doméstico. Né? Então, o que nós podemos entender com tudo isso? É que essa é uma luta que acaba sendo globalizada na ausência de direitos para as mulheres imigrantes. É preciso globalizar os direitos. No caso, há uma globalização da ausência dos direitos. Portanto, é muito importante reflexões e análises nesse sentido. A segunda questão, que aqui me move nesse último período, é que, e aí eu quero falar para o sindicalismo nacional e internacional, não haverá futuro para quem não enxergar parte da classe trabalhadora que sustenta a economia, que sustenta os trabalhadores que sustentam esta economia, que sustentam. Foi preciso ter uma pandemia para se entender que os trabalhadores são importantes. Então, eu penso que, neste momento de tragédia internacional, esta tragédia deixou visível toda esta tragédia que a classe trabalhadora vive. No Brasil, são os negros e as negras que estão no fronte dos trabalhos mais precários e que estão morrendo. Então, o sindicalismo não vê isso? Não vê, vai acabar no futuro. Porque se tem uma situação de muita crueldade nesse momento, ele está muito claro os marcadores sociais no nosso país. Marcadores de quê? As mulheres negras, os jovens, são as que mais sofrem. Isto pode ser ignorado? Marcadores que essas pessoas não estão fortemente nas pautas de negociação do sindicalismo. Então, a minha compreensão é que nós vamos fechar um ciclo com esta pandemia e que é preciso ter um sindicalismo aberto e novo para um novo, para um novo momento da sociedade. Portanto, o sindicato que não enxergar as mulheres, o sindicato que não enxergar os negros e as negras, como os que mais precisam nesse momento, na nossa mão sindical, eles tendem a finalizar a sua missão deste planeta. Porque este, no meu, no meu país, são a maioria. Reveladas, revelados, nos momentos mais trágicos. Não que não soubéssemos que eram maioria, mas me parece que foi preciso ter uma pandemia para revelar o quanto tudo isso é drástico e o quanto nós não estamos cuidando desta pauta. Então, acho que são desafios do século. Um sindicalismo mais articulado com a verdadeira classe trabalhadora, que está, uma parte delas, excluídas pela nossa própria organização. Então, acho que é um desafio para ser pensado. E aí estão as mulheres, em sua grande maioria, como as mais precarizadas. Então, as mulheres vão querer ficar no sindicalismo desse. Que não as representa. Então, esse é o grande desafio para o próximo período nosso. Obrigada, Neira. Amen, Carmen, absolutely. And I think uh, both what I, I want to build the break on both what you and, and, and uh, Carmen and Hilda have talked about. Um, I want to delve into a little bit after the break about traditional trade unionism too, because I think that is so important. Um, but I want to give any, any you have a minute <laughs> before the break, uh, just for your initial um, intervention, and then I'll start with you after the break uh, also, but please go ahead, Annie. Yes, thank you. I would like to thank Carmen for raising something that I really wanted to say. The first thing is what it means to be a feminist. And I, I can't am... hear you. Are other people, can other people hear her? Or is it... Uh, okay. Sorry, can you hear me now? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ahead. Sure. Yeah. So I I would like to thank Carmen for raising something that is very core to our discussion today. First is what it means to be feminist. I think this is something that needs to be discussed over and over again because again uh, there are some discussion I believe in the feminist movement when it comes to uh, you know uh, what uh, should be the focus of feminist movement mm -hmm. and the pandemic really brought us to the core that when we say we are feminists we cannot choose what we want to fight for if you know there are women who are in the marginalized sector they are really exploited and we know that 270 million migrants half of half of half of it are women then practically feminists must fight for women mig for women uh, migrant workers everywhere in the world. So I think this is really about our standpoint as a feminist. I would like to again to reinforce this uh, because uh, in the past I had a lot of discussion where feminist activists really choose only like gender gender uh, issue or maybe sexual orientation. But when it comes to, you know, workers issues, marginalized, displaced women, it become really like neglected. I think this is one of the things that I, I would like to thank Carmen for raising up the core of what is uh, what it means being feminist. Second is really about the issue of the trade unionism. One of the things that Ima uh, learned through the pandemic that the migrant workers cannot fight on our own. This is the era where we will be displaced, you know, we will be disintegrated and we will be really to some extent, you know, uh, dispersed by the government, by nation state. This is the time they will sacrifice the migrants. Of course, they sacrifice most of the marginalized people, but the migrants was before others. So we cannot fight the battle in the host countries where we are working, in the transit countries, even in our home countries, without the support of the majority of the population and all the more the trade union. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm quite a sad that up to this moment, we witnessed many, many trade unions choose not to include migrant workers in their constituency. They choose to ignore, they do not include migrant workers as part of the working class. And this is really big concern. In time of Malaysia, where migrants are being haunted, arrested, imprisoned, deported, no trade union talking about it. What is this? And a lot of migrants has been uh, not for months living in hunger they are even living on the street you know homeless because they have no job anymore no trade union talk about it this is a big issue so i think this is one thing that i would like to bring to the next discussion after the break neha about the role of the trade union uh what i call it a progressive trade union to the life and the plight of the migrant workers in the pandemic and even after the pandemic thank you Thank you so much, Eni. And I think that's a theme that we're hearing. And so after the break, we will talk about the role of trade unions in organizing migrant workers of all different identities. Um, and then also how you all have built alternative forms of organizing. I think NDWA is a very good example of that. And, and you know, how NDWA and, and IDWF came about in response to unions not responding in the ways any and Carmen and, and Hilda that you guys have talked about. So, uh, and I just talked very fast, sorry, interpreters. Um, so we're going to take a break, uh, just a five minute break, but that should give you some time to use the bathroom and to get something to drink. Um, and so we'll hear some music during the break. And when the music stops, that means we're coming back together. So thank you all. And if you have questions uh, for the panelists, we're gonna get to questions after the break. So please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions. Thank you all so much. We'll be back in five minutes. Thank you, another wonderful song. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so at the end of the, before we went to break, we started a conversation about uh, traditional unions and uh, exclusion, inclusion, um, building, organizing in, in traditional union formats. Um, and so I want to take us a little bit further into that conversation. I also see that we have some questions in the chat and in the Q&A that we're going to get to. And so to start, um, maybe, uh, let's see, maybe well, a few things. Okay, so maybe uh, Carmen, we'll go back to you first to sort of reflect on what Annie was talking about, um, the, that the, the relationship 
between unions and often non-traditional workers and uh, how we see migrant workers and others often being ignored uh, by unions. And I know it, you're not hearing me. Is there interpretation? Is it working? Carmen, can you hear me now? Thumbs, Carmen, if you can hear me, thumbs up. No. Let me see. If, let me just make sure the interpretation is working. Yes, now you can hear. Okay. <laughs> I was saying uh, before we went to the break, um, we started talking a little bit about organizing within unions and traditional unions. And any left us uh, sort of with, with uh, a really important conversation about uh, traditional unions um, ignoring certain sectors of workers, including migrant workers, um, workers of different identities, workers in the informal economy, I think. And so Carmen, I'd love to just start with you and then we'll move on to the other panelists to just reflect a little bit on how you were able to, how the COOT um, has been able to sort of uh, get beyond that, that and look at issues of black workers as you discussed, rural workers, workers in the informal economy that we're, we're and, and you started to talk about also before the break that, that unions are not gonna be relevant unless they recognize this reality. And so I'd just love to start with you, Carmen, and then we'll move to Hilda and Annie, and then Robin and, and, and Emily to sort of reflect on this idea of, of, of unions and organizing. And, and, I, and I have to say, just as someone who's been a unionist <laughs> her entire life, that I do very much believe in collective action and workers coming together. That's where the power is, right? But at the same time, as I said in my introduction, we know that anytime you have an organization with structures, you can have patriarchy built into that. You can have imperialism, colonialism, as Emily was, was mentioning, built into that. You can have racism, anti-migrant sentiments built into those structures and, and the way that the hierarchy is, is developed within it. Um, and so uh, we'd just love to hear your reflections on that, Carmen, and then we'll move on. Bom, primeiro, eu normalmente falo das minhas dores, é, porque para que sermos, sermos pessoas coletivas, nós temos uma vida antes disso, né? Então, quando eu disse o que é, que é ser feminista, é uma, é uma vivência cotidiana, é ser feminista todos os dias, é você também ser vista humanamente né, como lutadora da classe trabalhadora, mas você não deixa de ser uma mulher, não deixa de ser uma mulher negra, não deixa de ser uma mulher da Amazônia. E no caso do Brasil, uma mulher da Amazônia provavelmente tem muito mais dificuldade que uma mulher que está no centro do desenvolvimento nacional, na região sudeste do Brasil. Né? Então, isso tudo se configura como algo muito mais complicado, mais complexo para mim, pessoalmente. Coletivamente, nós temos uma... O CUT construiu uma Secretaria Nacional de Combate ao Racismo, né? e desde antes do governo do presidente Lula, nós é, também pressionamos que dentro do Estado Nacional tivesse um espaço que pudesse ser um espaço reparador da desigualdade, do racismo existente no Brasil. Então, esse sempre foi um grande desafio nosso na, na, na CUT. É, os dados de hoje sobre o racismo, sobre esses novos desafios dos trabalhadores negros e negras, eles são assustadores. A juventude brasileira que vive nas periferias são mortas cotidianamente suspeitas de serem bandidos, desocupados é, e são mortas pela polícia do Estado. É, todos os dados trabalhistas demonstram uma pirâmide onde as mulheres negras estão 
na base da pirâmide, com os trabalhos mais precários possíveis. Né? As, nós temos uma federação de trabalhadoras domésticas, é, uma federação de trabalhadoras domésticas que são 95% de mulheres e mulheres negras. A nossa experiência foi lutar muito pela Convenção 189 para ser regularizada no Brasil, porque era a último, última categoria a ser reconhecida enquanto seus direitos. Então, a gente trabalhou muito nesta luta para reconhecimento do trabalho das empregadas domésticas no Brasil. É, e temos trazido isso para nossa pauta, é, cada vez mais. Todas nós estamos espertas e atentas para o que acontece na sociedade, é, para levantarmos a mão e questionar internamente no movimento sindical e na sociedade brasileira sobre o lugar das mulheres negras, sobre o lugar das mulheres no mundo do trabalho. É, o capitalismo cada vez mais nos coloca numa situação de mais precarização e mais exploração. E uh, não é mais possível nesse momento, tanto pela tecnologia, tanto pela, pela, pelo apelo mundial do lugar de determinados setores na sociedade. Acho que a, a luta que foi levantada é, pelas vidas negras, as vidas negras importam nesse momento difícil, ele teve capacidade de ter um lastro internacional e essas questões estão sendo questionadas na sociedade. Elas ganharam um, um grau maior de visibilidade com a morte é, deste companheiro no Brasil, com a morte de uma pessoa com um, com um jeito muito parecido, né, de uma pessoa negra abordada no supermercado, e o supermercado é o Walmart, que tem em vários lugares do mundo, é onde também uma, uma, um jovem foi morto, espancado e com o seu pescoço sufocado. Então, estas questões elas não passam mais impune pela sociedade. Elas precisam estar no centro da discussão de um país que nem o meu, que é um país majoritariamente negro, por mais que isso seja, todos os dias, tentado ser invisibilizado. Então, nós temos experiência com, as, com a Federação das Trabalhadoras Domésticas, nós temos experiência com a Secretaria de Combate ao Racismo, estruturada na CUT nacional e em todas as, as CUTs estaduais. Nós temos experiências com as alianças que nós temos feito. E eu aqui reitero, a aliança da CUT com o Solidar Center no Brasil, né? porque esta aliança tem nos dado um impulso fantástico em várias áreas. Com os negros e as negras, um trabalho mais geral, urbano, mas com os negros e as negras, com um trabalho rural. E hoje, aqui no Brasil, estamos iniciando uma região importante. Estamos iniciando, não é iniciando, dando sequência a um trabalho extraordinário que nós estamos fazendo junto com o Solidar Center no Brasil, né, da FLCU. Trabalho extraordinário. Nós vamos ter hoje, estamos tendo, já começou uma importante atividade, eu já tenho que sair correndo para lá, com todos os cuidados da OMS, mas um trabalho com negros quilombolas, porque nós estamos à margem de um rio, que é um rio que está pensado para o desenvolvimento na visão do capitalismo, mas que destrói o meio ambiente, que é, invade as terras quilombolas. Nós temos feito trabalhos em nível urbano, então eu aproveito a oportunidade para agradecer muito esta aliança do Brasil, do Estado do Pará, com o Solidarity Center, a FLCU, porque não é possível mais trilharmos num processo onde 
a gente não enxerga mais tudo isso. Então, eu penso que o sindicalismo mais tradicional, que, são, que a gente chama aqui no Brasil de um sindicalismo de carteira azul, está passando por uma transformação. E os seus dirigentes precisam estar atentos e acompanhar esta transformação, olhando o lugar dos novos sujeitos do mundo do trabalho. Então, esses novos sujeitos, quem cuidará desses novos sujeitos? E para que eles estejam presentes no nosso sindicalismo, que está em transformação, porque o mundo está em transformação, o trabalho está em transformação, nós precisamos sermos capazes de elevar a nossa qualidade né, nesses debates. E, mais uma vez, eu sinto que as mulheres têm sido protagonistas desse debate de um novo processo. As mulheres que estão no movimento sindical, a juventude, mas elas não podem estar do lado de fora do sindicalismo. Elas têm que estar cada vez mais dentro. né? E a experiência que nós temos é que nós temos grandes mobilizações de mulheres no nosso país que impulsionam um melhor sindicalismo. E a experiência que eu tenho é que nós temos também muitas vozes se levantando e essas vozes precisam ser cada vez mais traduzidas em ações sindicalistas é, que renovam o nosso movimento sindical. Eu não acho que o movimento sindical não quer tratar essas questões. O movimento sindical não está acostumado, não tem uma tradição de tratar e lidar com esta diversidade etnocultural, uma diversidade de muitas vozes das mulheres. E nós somos as mais oprimidas, e as vozes oprimidas se levantam nesse momento na sociedade mundial. E aí o, o, o sindicalismo precisa estar aberto para essas vozes e para estas presenças que vivem a opressão por termos mulheres, mas que se agravam muito mais quando se tratam de mulheres negras, pobres e de determinadas regiões do mundo. Então, este marcador é muito mais agravado. Então, essa nossa experiência é, e este momento histórico de páginas trágicas da classe trabalhadora tem que deixar um grande legado que são os aprendizados, os novos processos, as novas vozes que precisam ser incluídas. E eu, eu tenho certeza que nós seremos capazes de atravessar as dificuldades e sairmos muito mais fortes, muito mais empoderadas, enquanto voz, enquanto estratégia, enquanto um movimento sindical internacional renovado. Thank you so much. One of the things that I share with you is is this moment that we are that we are in. It, it feels very significant um, in terms of everything we've been through with COVID, all of the anti-racism work that's going on around the world, all the anti-misogyny work, the work that our progressive movements are doing in taking on capitalism, imperialism, um, global economic systems that we're just tired of living under. Um, I think all of that is so important. So let's continue that conversation. We've had a, a few questions um, come up that I would like to raise to the panelists. Hilda, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I'm merging some of the questions together. Um, but one of the questions that came up is that uh, we see sometimes in movements that you have women's organizations, for example, um, anti-trafficking organizations, others that have a very narrow focus. And we'll, uh, the question said, focus on things like child marriage, for example, but forget to look at the bigger underlying root causes, underlying oppressions, um, et cetera, in the work. And so how do you respond to that? And, and I know, for example, again, NDWA, one of my favorite organizations, 
is so good at looking at uh, broader issues in, in the We Dream in Black, in the uh, immigration platform that you all have. So for example, maybe if you could talk a little bit about the criminal justice work that you all do, the immigration rights work that you all do, how does NDWA incorporate this understanding of doing organizing and standing up for workplace rights for domestic workers, but at the same time also understanding that we have to address other issues in society. Bueno, gracias, Nija. Eso es una muy buena pregunta. Um, creo que, eh, como lo, lo dije en, en el principio, el, el trabajo y la estructura organizativa de NDWA se creó por trabajadoras, ¿verdad? Eh, eso es lo que ha, eh, eh, ha, sido, um, ha, ha sido diferente en, esta, en este movimiento de trabajadoras aquí en los Estados Unidos y incluye todos los sectores. Y cuando hablamos de incluir los sectores, eh, incluimos también en nuestras campañas uh, um, eh, más allá de la sobrevivencia, que, que también incluye la campaña de, um, de, de lo que tú estabas mencionando, porque uh, nosotros educamos a las trabajadoras del hogar eh, porque el, la industria de, de trabajadoras del hogar se ha utilizado ¿Verdad? Para eh, poder traficar con mujeres, por ejemplo, ¿verdad? Eh, eh, invitándolas desde, su, desde sus um, lugares de origen, ¿verdad? Hacia los Estados Unidos, invitándoles a, a, a hacer un trabajo en el hogar, de, eh, ofreciéndoles salarios eh, bien remuneradas. Entonces, cuando entran al país, eh, vienen a ver una realidad que, que están siendo traficadas estas mujeres. Entonces, también utilizan el trabajo del hogar como una, como una vía de, de, um, de ofrecer y de engañar a mujeres que, que vienen a, a buscar oportunidades laborales aquí en, en este país. Y, y como lo mencioné también, las políticas públicas, ¿verdad? Las políticas públicas, públicas han sido nuestra base fundamental de, de, de hacer cambios en, 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 en diferente área de, de nuestro trabajo, eh, trabajo organizativo. Hemos venido a cambiar la historia, ¿verdad? Como, como trabajadoras del hogar. Hemos venido a cambiar la historia, hemos venido a... Um, a formar, eh, por ejemplo, el, el programa de We Dream in Black, que es un programa eh, eh, donde eh, fui parte de ese programa por dos años y medio desde que se fundó uh, para, para organizar eh, eh, las voces de las mujeres negras aquí en los Estados Unidos y la diáspora. Y cuando yo digo voces negras y la diáspora, no únicamente afroamericanas, sino que también uh, a mujeres negras inmigrantes en este país, eh, eh, porque eh, desafortunadamente eh, 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 nos ligan como mujeres, eh, mujeres afroamericanas eh, por el perfil racial, porque hablamos de perfiles raciales. Entonces, cuando, cuando no te identificas como... como como inmigrante en este país que viene de una región diferente, de un país diferente, eh, te ponen en una categoría como, como, como mujer afroamericana. Entonces hay que, eh, en, hemos estado cambiando esa retórica también dentro del trabajo de NDWA uh, para que se nos reconozca como tal, como, como inmigrantes. Eh, muchísimos años mucha gente me reconocía como mujer eh, afroamericana, ¿verdad? Hasta yo salir poco a poco a hablar de mi identidad, de dónde vengo, quién soy, para, para poder eh, ser incluida en esos procesos de trabajo aquí, aquí en los Estados Unidos. Entonces, eh, eh, se basa en, en, en ir reconociendo no nada más los derechos, sino que también eh, la, la, la identidad de la persona, la, la identidad de, la, de, la, de las mujeres inmigrantes. Y hemos, hemos eh, contribuido verdad en, en, en ese reconocimiento a través de... De, de un trabajo eh, arduo organizativo, ¿verdad? El trabajo organizativo ha sido la llave principal de, de, uh, de ese movimiento de trabajadoras del hogar aquí. Y, y entonces, pero también uh, más allá de eso, uh, uh, hablamos de, 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 uh, uh, de entrar en la parte de la inmigración. Eh, eh, hablar de la parte de la migración eh, también nos ven 
como lo mencioné antes, que, que tenemos ese perfil racial, de que no tenemos ningún problema con la migración en el país. Y, y vamos, yo tuve que contar mi historia, ¿verdad? Porque estoy en el movimiento de trabajadoras del hogar en los Estados Unidos como negra, porque yo tuve que salir a desnudarme literalmente de lo que quién es Gilda, ¿verdad? Para poder yo encajar en una sociedad en la cual me estaban tomando como, como, como afroamericana. Y, y, no, y, no, y no quiero eh, este, este, decir, ok, a mí no me gustaría ser afroamericana. No, simplemente yo necesito que me reconozcan como tal. Vengo de un país buscando oportunidad de trabajo. Este, me quedé aquí indocumentada por más de 16 años. Eh, eh, entonces eso fue, por eso estoy aquí sentada el día de hoy. Porque yo creo en el cambio. Yo creo, eh, eh, tengo fe eh, en que nuestro movimiento va a trascender a través del cambio y la movilización de las trabajadoras del hogar eh, en los Estados Unidos. Y, y, y hablamos ya de la parte de la discriminación, como lo hablaba la, a la compañera Carmen. Carmen, y no quiero ser repetitiva en eso, pero yo, este, um, todo lo que ella menciona en su presentación, lo hemos vivido de este lado como, como inmigrantes, ¿verdad? Y, y, este, y, y ni digamos viniendo de un país, de un país racista como nuestros países latinoamericanos. Hay que reconocer el, el embate del racismo, la discriminación y cómo eh, eh, tenemos que estar peleando dentro de esa intersección a través de una estructura, ¿verdad? Por eso cuando, cuando NDWA se formó, se formó en base de un comité coordinador y se sigue formando, haciendo esas, eh, esas elecciones democráticamente en el sector de las trabajadoras del hogar y las trabajadoras que, que hacen trabajo de niñera y trabajo de cuidado para que sean ellas las que lideren su movimiento. Nosotros lideramos nuestro movimiento de trabajadoras del hogar en los Estados Unidos. O sea, eh, eh, es, es cierto de que se cuestiona muchas veces las jerarquías dentro de algunas organizaciones, porque las jerarquías eh, eh, se vienen también implementando um, por lo que nosotros queremos estar contrarrestando, por, eh, en contra de lo que estamos eh, eh, peleando allá afuera, lo estamos teniendo dentro. Entonces, se basa de mucha educación dentro de nuestro movimiento la, de, de trabajadoras del hogar o nuestras organizaciones o sindicatos, como se maneja ese término a nivel internacional, porque aquí en los Estados Unidos hablamos más, eh, trabajamos más a, a nivel organizativo con organizaciones, porque no, no, no estamos sindicalizados, ¿verdad? Eso no, no es una, una sindicalización, porque los sindicatos que trabajan acá son, eh, trabajan con, con membresía que son también legales en, es, en el país. Y, y el, el, el porcentaje mayor de nuestras, de nuestras membresías como, como NDWA son mujeres inmigrantes que vienen de un país eh, eh, huyendo de muchas veces de esos países, ¿verdad? Entonces necesitamos eh, eh, enfocarnos en, en, en cada historia, en, en cada situación. Eh, nos hemos visto eh, 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 trabajar muy duro para, para ser inclusivas dentro de nuestro propio movimiento, porque eh, vivimos... Eh, eh, casi cuatro años de represión política aquí en este país, cuatro años, buenos años de represión, donde, donde no, nos retrasaron mucho en nuestro trabajo, que allá habíamos avanzado, y estamos tratando la manera de encaminar nuevamente en recuperar esos, esos cuatro años de, de atraso. Entonces, las voces de las trabajadoras del hogar hace aproximadamente... Eh, unos, unos días es, estuvieron eh, lanzando otra campaña de campaña de cuidado en, en Washington, D.C. para seguir movilizando. Es que, es que es, eh, eh, el, el movimiento ha estado revolucionando aquí, eh, eh, ha tenido una visibilidad enorme y, y queremos servir también como, como ejemplo, ¿verdad? Como una plataforma de estructura, porque eh, eh, lo, lo, como lo mencioné anteriormente, nosotros, nosotros vamos más allá. ¿Verdad? El trabajo de NDW es un trabajo ambicioso, por eso hemos estado logrando mucho en poco tiempo que hemos estado en, en ese movimiento aquí en los Estados Unidos y, y, y vienen más. Eh, eh, tenemos más de 75 organizaciones afiliadas a, a, a NDWA aquí y, y hemos ganado más de 10 cartas de derecho. Una de las cartas de derechos ambiciosas se ganó aquí en el estado de Washington 
y, y estamos lanzando nuestra carta de derecho a nivel federal para los 50 estados, porque no podemos estar ganando protecciones para un grupo de mujeres de trabajadoras del hogar, dejando otro grupo de mujeres de trabajadoras del hogar atrás. Entonces, eh, estamos eh, involucrando a todos los sectores en, en, nuestro, en nuestro trabajo organizativo eh, eh, para, para que sean inclusivos. Nuestro trabajo es trabajar en inclusión, eh, eh, trabajar, este, eh, contrarrestar la interseccionalidad que ha sido como un, un, un cáncer en, nuestro, en, nuestros, en nuestra sociedad. Entonces, eh, eh, estamos haciendo la diferencia y ustedes pueden entrar eh, el, al, al website de NDWA para que ustedes puedan informarse y, 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 ver, y ver todo el trabajo que hemos estado tratando de hacer en, en el país y, y me siento muy orgullosa de que yo empecé desde abajo como inmigrante en este país vine sin conocer mi, mi, mis derechos desde mi país hasta llegar como trabajadora del hogar aquí en, aquí en los Estados Unidos y, de, y, y hace un mes me senté con, con, con Kamala Harris para seguir teniendo ese diálogo de inclusión y, y, y llegar a una legalización también para las trabajadoras del hogar en el país, porque son, son más de 11 millones de, de, de inmigrantes indocumentados, pero dentro de esos 11 millones hay 2.5 millones de, de, de trabajadoras del hogar, por lo cual queremos que sean incluidos en, en todos los procesos de los 400 mil millones de dólares que le estamos pidiendo a John Biden para que avance con la política de, y la agenda de las trabajadoras del hogar en los Estados Unidos. Thank you so much, Hilda. And again, a few really important things there. I think uh, at th the point you just concluded on in the meetings, sorry, I'm talking fast again, that you had with Vice President Harris is, is looking at the care economy. And again, this is the idea of looking at things, not just from a narrow viewpoint, um, but broader. And what does, what does domestic work mean for our care economy, et cetera? And I think that's Amazing. And then the other thing that that I noted is that uh, NDWA does so much on leadership. And hopefully, if we have a few more minutes, just talk how intentional um, it is about uh, NDWA is about building leadership of different voices in the movement. Any, I'm going to come to you now. Um, if you could reflect a little bit also on the question that I asked Hilda, that that we had a question in Indonesian in the in the Q and A about. Um, when, when we have movements that we want to be working and building and organizing with, but yet those movements can be very narrow um, or very exclusive in some ways, how you deal with that. And as you raised the issue at, toward, at before the break about unions and not being responsive to migrants, if there's anything you can talk about, about how you have built, how you've organized around um, uh, different movements, different kinds of organizations, et cetera. And then we have another question that I'm gonna ask all the panelists and we may be out of time. I always think we have so much time and then we run out, but any, if you wanna go ahead and respond to that. Yes, thank you, Neha. So uh, it has really been a challenge. Uh, you know, I just really uh, depart from my own uh, experience. I'm a migrant domestic worker in formal sector, trying to organize my fellow migrants. And even we are legal migrant workers in our, you know, uh, Hong Kong, for example, it's not very easy to appeal to other organizations to even be part or support our movement. It's not that easy, yeah? So as has been mentioned by Carmen, even uh, Gilda, you know, all this aspect of segregation, differentiation, we, you are different from us, it's very, very strong, you know, not only about the color, but also about the class, you know, and then that you are foreigner, that's all, you know, so there is, there is no way for us to even include you in our cause. So uh, for many, many years, this is the reason why International Migrants Alliance was established in 2008, because we see there are two issues that we are really facing uh, globally, regionally, nationally. One, that most of the issues of migrant workers are not being uh, presented, represented by migrants themselves. It's always some other people talking about us. It is not wrong. I don't say it's wrong. It's, it's, it's not because it's, it has nothing to do with intention. But uh, most of the issues presented doesn't really present holistically about our issues. For, exa for example, when I became active in the regional international platform, I found out most discussion has something to do only about labor rights. 
They don't talk about undocumented. They don't talk about police brutality. They don't talk about immigration, imprisonment. They don't talk about deportation. So all these issues in actual uh, uh, realities is really, I can say, the biggest issues of the migrants, you know, people being undocumented and recognized for decades, for example, no one talk about that in the ILO, you know, in the United Nations, no one raising that. It's only about wages, holiday, and so forth, so forth, which is only covering certain number of people within migration, but it doesn't cover wholly the whole segment of the population. And that's my, this is really our biggest concern. We want to speak the truth the truth that ex we experience ourselves. So I think two issues. One is about self-representation. It's very key to this. We are the people who lose nothing for talking anything we want to say because that's our reality. That's our fight. That's our battle. When I talk to the United Nations, even in the open, open opening of the General Assembly, I had no hesitation just telling everything I want to say. Yeah, I don't care about funding agency. I don't care about government or, you know, president and so forth. Why? Because it's really about my life. You know, it is me who suffer all this type of unjust regulation policies and brutality. And I want them to know that. So something like that. So I think self-representation in any discussion on migration is very important. But the second also uh, is, is also the fact that uh, aside of the self-representation is also the, the various issues that we want the government, the U United Nations, the ILO, or even any national body to recognize. We are very tired of being denied. We are being tired, tired of, of being dismissed, you know, as if, we, we, you're, as if we are not having any problem. You know, all countries pretend everything is okay, everything under control, nothing happened, you know. So they always put migration under the radar, even from the local population. So you don't see many, uh, you know, uh, news coming out from, from the media talking about how women are being raped in the prison, for example, how children are being arrested. They don't put that in the news. But we, people who live on the ground, we know that because we organize, we do outreaching, we help each other, we know all those realities. And I think those kind of stories have must have a justice, you know, at least justice to be listened to. So I think this is the reason why when IMA was formed, we know this is our challenge. Our challenge is speak for ourselves speak the truth and speak for ourselves. So I think this is one thing. Now, in terms of your second question, how we are engaging with other different type of movement who might actually try, is for very hesitant or maybe close their door to even talk about us. I think I don't want to put prejudice against any group. We believe that a lot of people don't understand. That's why IMA in the, main, in the past years has been trying to address to women, trade union, interfaith community, any uh, student even, you know, children. We try to explain about migration, who we are, why we are here, you know? So we want to, we want to make them understand even to our own employers, because many of them are also ignorant to our reality. We work for them for years. They don't even ask like, why are you here in the first place? They take for granted that you are poor, so you need job, that's all. So I think a lot of people really need an education. So it's not enough for the migrant workers to only mingle among ourselves. This is one thing that I appeal to all migrant movement or organization. It's not enough for us to talk about our suffering all the time. It's important for us to express and bridge all those things to others so people know how to support us in whatever capacity from the church for example who provides shelter from any institution who provide uh, you know healthcare or whatever even the local who just want to provide assistance by listening to our stories i think that's that's really a big the beauty of of this kind of solidarity and unity i think that's one thing I don't want to put any, how to say, judgment that, oh, this group are isolating and they don't. Yes, people are ignorant. This is a reality. But I think the way to approach is really to create this kind of understanding. So I, I really appreciate this discussion because it's a way for us to know about each other. And, and the question of everyone, even when you are not part of any movement or, or, or any NGOs, as a person, as a supporter, you really ask yourself, what can I do for you? How can I help you? 
you know, so this is one thing that I want to send a message to individual supporter. For you to listen is really one big help. For you to write our story, telling in English because we don't speak English very well, is already a big help. If you can write in Chinese, it's all a big help. If you can donate money, all the more we appreciate. You know, whatever you can do is a big help for us on the ground. So I think that's one message that I want to say. Thank you, Neha. Thank you so much, Eni. I think I found someone who talks faster than me, though, Eni. You talk. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just, just in the next round for the interpreter, slow down. But everything you yeah, said okay. was 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 right on, and I think a call to action for us. So we only have about 15 minutes left. There was one uh, question in the chat, and then so I'm going to ask this question to everyone, including Emily and Robin. Um, and then ask everyone for your last reflections, because I think among uh, the five of you, that'll take up the next 15 minutes. So thank you so much. But Carol Barton from uh, the Women in Migration Network said, um, it's clear that the heart of your work is building power among workers within your countries. That's where the strength lies. Can you say what relevance you see regarding organizing for global policy on labor rights migration? What would a global organizing strategy look like at this time as domestic workers did around ILO Convention 189? Is it needed? Is it relevant? If so, what is the most urgent for your members? So I think one of the things that we wanted to take out of this conversation today is with all of us from all around the world, you know, what, what, is, what is a global organizing strategy we could have from our intersectional feminist lens? Uh, to build a grassroots movement around. And I've already heard from Carmen and Hilda and any pieces of this, but it'd be great if you could reflect on what, what do you think is needed for such a global organizing strategy? What, is, what are the topics? And again, I think some of the things Carmen said around COVID-19 and the anti-Black racism movement, et cetera, might be relevant, but would love to hear from each of you what you think of that. I'm gonna start backwards um, and Emily go to you and then Robin and then Carmen, Hilda, and Eni. Okay, so go ahead. Sorry, you want to start with me? <laughs> you can also reflect on what you've heard. This is your last chance. You get you get two minutes. <laughs> two, three okay, minutes. I wasn't quite ready to reflect on that particular question. That's okay. I did really want to speak to um, is sort of bringing together a lot of what people have said around um, organizing and, and in unions, especially sort of thinking about migrant workers, um, domestic workers as part of the greater union movement. And so I did wanna say that, you know, I think those unions that are dedicated to organizing um, from the sort of mindset of organizing views power as expansive and inclusive um, they might be better positioned to think about um, and engage with um, this approach, the in intersectional feminist organizing, particularly being inclusive um, and organizing migrants and any, mar really quite frankly, any group of marginalized people requires that organizations in fact center the needs of people above all else. And in order to shift power away from traditional patriarchal structures, um, you know, intersectional organizing centers the people. Um, and what does that mean? I mean, one might say, well, an organization that centers its membership um, is centering the people, but this expands the variety and capacity to influence society as a whole when you're looking at power as expansive. So you're talking not just about membership, but workers broadly. Um, and so, so I would say, you know, if we think back, some unions view themselves, um, their role as they service members. They, they do for members what they need, what they ask for. Um, rather than perhaps creating spaces for workers to stand up for themselves. And this is where I see the panelists are, are talking about these concepts that, you know, this group of people agrees on where you're, you're getting people to know their rights to stand up for themselves and to enforce any legislation or even collective agreements that have been hard fought. Um, 
and they unite people. So shifting out of old habits that maybe some unions have been accustomed to that served them for a period of time, but they're not going to forever. Um, and uh, it won't expand the membership and the sort of view by greater society that unions are necessary for a functioning uh, democratic society. Um, and you know, thinking about not falling into tropes of, uh, of patriarchy that many of us have internalized. I mean, I think we need to reflect that organizations are made up of people. Unions are made up of people who are a part of a society and we are imperfect. We have grown up in white supremacist societies, colonial societies, um, racist and sexist societies. So it's hard, this is hard work for us to do and on the one hand, we want to give ourselves grace for doing the work, but at the same time, push ourselves that we can do this, which means we're going to fail. It means we'll be uncomfortable. And a lot of organizations, particularly unions, have quite a, a sense of nervousness around failure. Um, and uh, so I, I did wanna say that I think that there's this humility and um, or calling for humility amongst organizations. I think that the power that a lot of the, you know, the panelists of, of this discussion have really brought forth um, on those organizations, particularly with um, working with workers who have been uh, traditionally oppressed and left out of the unions of structures. Um, it's hard, but it's essential for, for, for the survival of the labor movement. Um, and I just wanna say one other thing about power. I think many view power as finite and limited. Um, some unions will refer to getting their piece of pie or cake, um, that there is one dessert available and we have to slice it up in only so many little pieces rather than thinking of it as say a potluck and where every new person who is involved is bringing more and more power to the movement, to the organization and even to themselves. So I, I hope that connected to some of the points that really felt like you know, it inspired me from what Annie said regarding unions. We've got hard, long work to do, but if unions in the traditional senses don't figure out how to be expansive, their future is not looking so great. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. So Robin, over to you. And one thing I forgot to note, there was a question about um, also organizing women migrant workers with disabilities and, and some of the other intersectionalities that come in. So Robin, in your two minute concluding remarks, if you could somehow <laughs> address that too, and I'll, I'll turn to the other panelists for that in their closing too. Go ahead, Robin. Sure, no problem. I just, again, wanna recognize and thank um, our three uh, panels today, um, Hilda, um, Eni, and Carmen, um, you know, just lifting up their words and their experiences. Um, and again, um, what a rare opportunity to learn um, as someone who uh, hopefully is an ally um, in, this, in this journey. And I think, um, you know, I wanted to answer this call to action. Any, I so relate to your, um, when I get excited and start talking about the things that energize me and motivate me in this work, I also talk very quickly. And so I just wanted to, um, honor and recognize the theme that came through in what you said and what sisters Carmen and sisters Zelda said today, which is only through you leading us, you it, through your agency and your voice, only through that will the change that we need to see happen in unions or other organizing structures happen. And so it's about investing in that. And you know, to Carol's question, I think we do have some examples of where when that has happened, we see significant change um, on the global level with International Labor Organization Convention 189 um, that just celebrated a big anniversary uh, this year um, for domestic workers. 
and then ILO Convention 190, which was adopted just two years ago um, to address violence and harassment uh, in the world of work. And it's that second convention that I'm more familiar with. So I just wanna highlight um, some pieces of that because it really raises the themes of, of how a feminist intersectional um, focus leads to inclusion and not just inclusion, but centering the needs of workers who are traditionally marginalized, including migrant workers. And um, over a 10 year period, um, workers, um, migrant workers were leaders in a global feminist coalition made up of labor unions, workers' rights organizations, human rights organizations, feminist organizations that demanded and recognized the need to eradicate gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. And importantly, through their leadership, the ILO, as you were saying, Ina, doesn't always do this, but they took notice and they agreed, right, to, to put on their standard setting agenda, a standard for the first time to recognize a human right to be free from all forms of violence and harassment. And tremendously, a centerpiece, a centerpiece of that labor standard is gender-based violence and harassment because it is so prevalent and because the women workers from all around the world demanded that that remain centered. And then importantly, it doesn't just cover the formal economy. It in, for, in order for countries to come into compliance, it requires that all workers, all workers be covered. And, in, and specifically migrant workers and domestic workers, um, vendors, all are named specifically, expressly, so that we're not excluding, and those are mostly women, right? Like really, let's just pause for a moment and recognize that when you lead, when we lead that, that's radical, what I've just said to you. And Ina, you touched on this, right? Like these are spaces where your needs and your experiences and your rights are not recognized historically. And yet here they are. And also the convention doesn't just apply to buildings where work is performed. It's the world of work, it's everywhere. It's homes, it's the street, it's the community, it's on the commute. So I just wanna say we have seen the power of coming together and that organizing that you all are doing collectively, globally can result in, in now bringing that to the national level. Um, so I just wanna honor again, your incredible life's work and your leadership um, because it's a heavy lift as you've all described in spaces, all right, that don't uh, recognize and center the needs of, of women migrant workers. So thank you, my feminist sisters. Thank you, Robin. So concluding remarks by our panelists, uh, just two minutes each, please. I'll, I'll start with Carmen and then we'll go to Hilda and then any, you're gonna have the last word. So Carmen, two minutes. Vamos lá, dois minutos. Então, em primeiro lugar, eu estou agradecida por esta oportunidade maravilhosa. Em segundo lugar, falar de poder requer um bom tempo, porque depende da sua visão sobre poder. E eu sempre aposto na ideia de poder da organização como fundamental. Quando a gente tem a organização, quando a gente consegue, de fato, se organizar, a gente tem poder, e é o poder da classe trabalhadora e é o poder das mulheres. Né? Acho que neste próximo período, neste século, nós temos que juntar o nosso velho jeito de fazer organização e potencializar com as novas tecnologias. Portanto, nós temos que fazer com que o nosso poder aumente com aquilo que está colocado para nós de desafio nesse momento. E é preciso construir é, espaço global de articulação para que a gente possa ter mais poder. É, e penso também que nós mulheres precisamos nos preparar para também assumir poder institucional. Sabe? Que bom quando a companheira Gilda é, disse que fizeram uma reunião com a vice-presidenta dos Estados Unidos para tratar de uma pauta extremamente importante, que são as mulheres trabalhadoras domésticas, e digam se fosse um homem, 
vice-presidente, trataria deste tema assim um pouco mais rápido, era bem mais difícil, né? Então, é importante ter mulheres nos espaços de poder, mas mulheres feministas e comprometidas com a agenda é, das próprias mulheres. Não basta ser mulher e estar nos espaços. É preciso ter mulher que tenha compromisso e que seja, na maioria das vezes, feminista. Nem sempre são feministas, mas precisam compreender a agenda da classe trabalhadora. Portanto, a luta por poder, para lutar, para garantirmos o nosso direito humano ao desenvolvimento, né, é, é algo que tem que estar colocado no centro da nossa disputa. Vivemos em disputa permanente, disputa por direitos. Então, um grande abraço a todas e todos. Eu acho que meus dois minutos já se foram. Eu estou muito feliz, né, Ra? por essa grande oportunidade, pelos comentários de Emily, pelo comentário, pelos comentários de Robin. A gente está na luta sempre. Thank you so much, sister. And so last two comments. Uh, Hilda, Hilda to you, and then Annie, you're going to have again the last word. Go ahead. Hilda, two minutes. Muchísimas gracias por... por uh, me siento muy nutrida, me voy muy nutrida, porque no nada más traemos información, traemos nuestra experiencia, porque seguimos aprendiendo, seguimos eh, eh, poniendo nuestro granito de arena, porque nosotros somos el cambio. Si, y cambiamos la narrativa, cambiamos la política, cambiamos la historia, ¿verdad? Entonces es, es muy importante que el diálogo continúe, por eso se llama diálogo, porque no se puede hacer una sola vez, ¿verdad? El, solamente a través del diálogo podemos encontrar cuáles son los puntos ciegos que tenemos en, en nuestra estructura organizativa dentro de nuestro movimiento, ¿verdad? Solamente a través del diálogo podemos hacer cambio, podemos eh, eh, hacer, eh, cambiar el mundo, de, el mundo del trabajo, el mundo del feminismo en general. El feminismo tiene que eh, eh, incluir todos los espacios, todos los espacios sin dejar ningún agujerito, porque para eso me identifico como feminista, porque yo estoy dentro del, de los zapatos de la persona discapacitada, de los LBGT, de las trabajadoras del hogar, de, de, de los indígenas, de todos los que están luchando por un derecho laboral, por un derecho de, de poder ser incluidos a nivel social, eh, porque eso era supuestamente el trabajo de los gobiernos, ¿verdad? Porque para eso los elegimos, pero como, como no nos hacen caso, tenemos que ir tras ellos, tras el enemigo, ¿verdad? Para que nos hagan, eh, eh, nos hagan respetar nuestros derechos, ¿verdad? Y hacer valer la calidad, el ser humano que somos. Venimos de nuestros países a buscar oportunidades de trabajo, la que no tenemos atrás. Tengo 21 años viviendo en los Estados Unidos y en esos momentos hay miles en la frontera atorados, ¿Verdad? Queriendo entrar al país, buscando oportunidades de trabajo, porque no hay oportunidades allá atrás. Entonces, sirvamos de modelo. Lo que, todo lo que yo hago en mi vida personal como Gilda, quiero servirle de modelo a las mujeres que yo organizo en mi comunidad. Y por eso estoy aquí, porque todo lo que hacemos como movimiento, sirvamos de modelo, no nada más en Estados Unidos, sino que a, a nivel internacional, para poder eh, eh, hacer es, esos cambios y también eh, 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 hermanarnos, hermanarnos con la gente que, que estamos sufriendo en esos momentos, en ese embate de la pandemia. Incluyamos, lo mencionabas, eh, eh, una, la compañera eh, también eh, Emily, ¿verdad? Que no, que no haya un pedazo de pastel, me encanta hablar de, con, con esos términos, que no haya un pedazo de pastel. Incluyamos el, el esfuerzo, el liderazgo de todas aquellas que creen en nuestras luchas, ¿verdad? Es, es, ya es tiempo, ya es hora. ¿Verdad? Están viendo muchas movilizaciones a nivel global con los cambios de gobiernos, ¿verdad? Gobiernos que, que mienten a nuestra sociedad y, y, y la verdad lo tenemos nosotros como movimiento y tenemos que sacarlos a relucir para que puedan haber cambios trascendentales para, para el futuro de, del feminismo y, y del trabajo de las mujeres en, 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 en Estados Unidos y a nivel global también. Gracias por... por por tenerme en el espacio y por favor no dejen de visitar 
la página y el website de NDWA para que puedan informarse más acerca de nuestro trabajo aquí en los Estados Unidos. Thank you so much, Hilda. So, Annie, over to you. We're over time, so I'm going to let you, as I said, Thank have you. the last just, word before. Uh, just... Yes, just very quick. Uh, the question of Carol, actually, um, one of the major talk now within the migrant movement, what is really the role of the, you know, uh, regional international NGO in relation to migrant movement? And also, is there any function of even advocating C189? Now we have global compact on migration, for example. So uh, again, I would like to first to reiterate that the movement of migrants really is a national base and it is really should be led by the migrants. We are living on the ground. We know what we need. We know what we want. So it is correct that we are the, really in the authority of what to do you know, on the ground. But again, we are facing two challenges at this point during the pandemic. One is in the countries where we are working, we are being attacked all the time. Our rights, our salary, our employment, anything is being under attack. Even our stay is very insecure. Even when you are legal, no one knows when you will be arrested and say now you are being deported. Okay. So at any given time, we could be kicked out. At any given time, we could lose the job. So this is another one big battle that we really need kind of solidarity from the trade union, from women movement, any movement who are willing to defend us because we are defenders at this point. We are really, our hand is already so tight. There is no way for us to can even defend ourselves. Now, the second big battle of the uh, you know, grassroots movement of migrants is really our question is what to do in our home countries. Once you are deported, we actually have no job at home, no subsidy from our government, no future even what to do. You know, we cannot just apply work abroad again because everywhere is locked down. So this is a big a dilemma of the migrant workers everywhere in the world. So I think this is what one of the big homework that we continue evaluating and find a way how to better campaign and advocate. For example, now in IMA, we are still advocating right to access uh, to vaccine and uh, testing for, for all, you know, for free. But second also, for government providing subsidy, financial support for all migrants, whether in the host countries, even when we go home, we should be provided at least six months to one year financial subsidy in time when we are unemployed, because we are the biggest remittance sender to most countries in the world. So it's time for all this government to pay back you know, to their migrant workers. We are the economic hero. They call us all the time as the savior of the nation, but yet we're in time of crisis like this, we are left behind. So we really feel that we are neglected, left behind, abandoned by all government. So this is the time that the grassroots movement are really questioning, what is the use of having United Nations? What is the use of having ILO? Do we really need C189, you know, when the battle is this, you know, harsh? So we believe that the institution, uh, the formation, the convention is really needed. We need a global uh, picture or global platform where all movement can unite together, learn from each other and advocate collectively. And this is the role of the, the, the C GCM, for example, you know, whether you agree or not, let's, you know, let's talk about that. And then the second also, the role of this convention is really pro to, uh, to, to, to give a new ammunition for the grassroots migrants to pressure our government. One C, uh, you know, the C189 is becoming our tool to push government to improve the working and living condition of domestic workers. Of course, they can always say no, but at least we have some moral ground to claim that we are human. You should respect us as human. So I think this is the correlation that we really needed. But again, what I would like to emphasize is um, it's important to always make sure for all advocates who are very active at regional, international, to always have consultation with the grassroots migrants on what are the urgent issues that you must carry to this kind of meetings. Please don't go there without a consultation because you might not know what is the most, more important. As I said, during pandemic, everything changed. Last year and this year is so different. Maybe next year is different again. So I think this partnership between NGOs, trade union, you know, supporter with the grassroots migrants is very, very crucial. We cannot travel everywhere. We don't have, we don't even speak English very well. We have no luxury of even filling up all those long forms just to join one meeting. So you have, 
So help us to bring all those issues, making sure all this government institution accountable to us as a migrant. So I think this is the time we demand accountability, not only from national government, but also even the ILO, the United Nations. Next year, there will be an international review for the GCM. It is time to ask, demand accountability. If you ask us what would be our strategy, mobilize. We have to surround the whole United Nations building, whether it's online or offline, and demand accountability from all government, United Nations, to respond to our urgent need. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Annie, and that's the perfect point to end on, I think, and one of the reasons we are doing this Feminist Friday session. I think what you said about inclusion, representation, agency of migrant workers themselves in these, in these forums, et cetera, who speaks on behalf of others and how uh, others are able to have agency to speak for themselves is definitely something that we have to continue to have a conversation about. Thank you so much to all of the sisters today. I, I want to remind everyone that the next Feminist Friday session is 6th of August and is titled Envisioning a Feminist Future in Labor Migration. So we will continue this conversation. We have absolutely Carmen, Hilda, and Annie, you gave us so much to think about and to reflect on and to lead us into that conversation about a feminist future of labor migration. Thank you to Robin and uh, Emily for your reflections. And again, on behalf of the Solidarity Center, GATW, AWID, Flex, and Women, thank you for everyone for joining Feminist Fridays. And Hilda, Carmen, and Annie, thank you so much, my sisters, for inspiring us, motivating us, and the amazing work that you all do. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, thank you so much.